Today we're going to install some power protection inside the RV hardwired, much like we did in the 397. But this one's a little bit different, it's gonna seem a little bit weird, but I'm gonna get into all the hows and whys and decisions behind this seemingly strange installation here behind me. Per usual with this type of project that involves wiring of electrical gear and things of that nature, this is a how I did it video, not a how to video, particularly because ours is gonna be a little bit different. But if you're not comfortable with wiring and dealing with electricity and 120 volt and all that stuff, get a professional to help you with this. Also per usual with this type of video, I'm gonna cover a lot of information. And if you wanna skip past some of the details and just get to the install or whatever, there'll be chapter markers down below. So feel free to use those and skip around as you like. If you followed us for a while, you might remember that in our last RV, we hardwired in a Southwire surge guard device right above our automatic transfer switch or ATS in the basement of the RV. This time around, because we like to try out different products and share different things with you guys, we are trying their direct competition, which is Hughes. For the record, there's nothing wrong with our surge guard. There's still nothing wrong with it if we could have installed it in here. We just like to try out different products just to give you guys a view of different things. You also might remember if you've watched us that we tried out the Hughes Auto Former last year, did a full round of tests and had a whole does it steal power video. So I'll refer you to that for the details on the Hughes Auto Former. But I bring that up because when we put that video out, Hughes reached out to us to see if we wanted to test out their Watchdog EPO, which is their surge protector. So they sent us that to try out. So thank you very much for that, Hughes. And just so you know, whenever we receive a free product from a company to try out, we are never under any obligation to say anything positive, negative. There's, we never have anything around limiting what we can say, good or bad about a product. If you're interested in our full review policy, we do have that on our website, and I'll link that down below in, in case you're interested. Before we get into the gear and the install and all that stuff, I do wanna cover some basics because I think there's a lot of confusion out there about you know a basic surge suppressor versus one that monitors voltage versus an auto former. So let's just cover those really, really quickly. And we'll start with the most basic, which is just a basic surge suppressor. First off, what the heck is a surge? You're probably pretty familiar. I mean, surge protectors have been around for a long time, particularly when you're hooking up computer gear and things that are more sensitive to surges. But a surge is a temporary increase in voltage, usually very quick, caused by anything from lightning to you know, some, something bad happens in the RV park power, or it could be a lot of different things. And the idea is that a, a surge in voltage like that is going to cause a surge in current to your electronic devices. A surge suppressor or surge protector does basically just what it sounds. It takes that extra voltage above what you want and shunts it, shunts it to ground and basically absorbs that. Now, you, typically your surge protectors are sacrificial, meaning they will take the brunt of that surge, but at cost to them. I, I speak like it's a person, but basically it's sacrificial and it will only work through so many surges or a certain size of surges. And the surge capability of any given surge suppressor is measured in joules. So that's one item you wanna look out for when you're comparing different surge suppressors is how much they can suppress in joules. With that in mind that these things are sacrificial, it's good to find a unit that has a user replaceable surge module so you don't have to just throw the whole thing away. So that's the thing to look for is a surge module that you can replace without trashing the whole thing. Some of your more advanced surge protectors also do a couple of extra things like checking your pedestal wiring, uh, making sure you don't have a, a short between neutral and ground, you know, that all the voltages look good and that type of thing. So it gives you a basic check on your pedestal wiring. But surge protection is its basic function and those are the most basic systems. Now, a step up from that is all of the above plus voltage monitoring and emergency cutoff. Uh, now, what this means is if your voltage gets too high or too low, that, without any surge involved, can also damage your electronics, and more importantly, it can damage things like your compressor and your motors and your AC. Particularly when you've got a low voltage situation, what happens is that low voltage makes the device, the compressor or the motor, draw more amperage to get the power it needs to run. This in turn causes heat and provides excess wear on those devices and can even just damage them permanently and burn them out. 
In the case of the Hughes device that we're installing, this is called EPO. They call this actually device called a Watchdog EPO. EPO stands for Emergency Power Off. And it does just like it says, if the voltage gets out of range, it shuts off power. Uh, not only does it shut off power while it has this out of range condition, if say it recovers right away, say your pedestal had a temporary problem, it won't turn power back on for 90 seconds. This gives your compressors and things like that time to recover. It's not good for them to be shut off and immediately back on. Now, most of these surge suppressors, whether you're talking about a basic surge suppressor or a surge suppressor with a little more advanced features, all the way up to like a surge protector with EPO, typically come in both a hardwired and pedestal format. And that just means either you have it hardwired inside your RV, or it's actually connected to the pedestal, it has plugs on it. Now, in most cases, these devices are going to have hard mount wire connections, meaning you can connect your four wires. Your 50 amp RV is gonna have uh, two hots, a neutral and a ground, whereas your 30 amp RVs are just gonna have a hot, a neutral and a ground. So you'll have a surge suppressor that's different for 50 amp versus 30 amp but you're typically gonna have the ability to hardwire them or just plug them into the pedestal. In which you do really just depends on your preference. Obviously, it's very easy to just plug one into the pedestal, plug in your RV and be done with it. The drawback there is it's outside, it's susceptible to theft. These things do have a locking ability. You can lock it to the pedestal. Uh, but you know, a simple $30 pair of bolt cutters from Lowe's can get around that pretty easy. So I've always preferred to hardwire it inside the RV. So what the heck is an auto former? Again, full video on this that I'll reference below, but the long and short story is, remember that low voltage I talked about where the EPO will just cut it off? Well, this takes it a step further and tries to boost your voltage. And basically it runs in line with your power just like the surge suppressor would. You'll typically put this in line before the surge suppressor. But what an auto former does is it steps up your voltage. Now this one from Hughes will bump up 2% all the time. So it's always boosting by 2%, which is not really a big deal. But if you go below 113 volts, it'll boost 10%. And let me tell you, this is something that we haven't run into a lot, but the one place we did run into it was summertime in Vegas, I think one or two years ago and it was a nightmare. AC to come on, but now this blue, see we've only got, we have 112 volts on line one now, but we only have 105, 104 on line two. It's tripped our breaker once, it's so stinking hot. I've only got 104 volts on line two, and, I only, and we're pulling 25 amps, and all I have running is the AC. The problem it causes, I mentioned because you've got lower voltage, your voltage lowers, your amps have to come up, when your amps come up, the heat comes up, it can damage the system. But what it also does is it causes your breakers to trip, I would say prematurely, but not really. They're, they're rated for a certain amperage, but you're gonna hit that amperage and that limit of your breakers much quicker because of that heat. And that's what we had in Vegas, and it was just horrible. <laughs> we could not get our ACs to stay on. Uh, it was it was a nightmare, and I wish we had had our auto former. We've carried one around ever since, but uh, it's a really good item to have. And it's one of those things that you might not need all the time, but when you need it, you need it. Now that all those devices and concepts are out of the way, let's get into our install and how I did this. Because it's, it's a little bit weird when you first look at it, but it's, stick with me, I'm gonna walk you through the logic here. When Hughes reached out after seeing our auto former video and offered it to send us their watchdog EPO, I said, great, let's do this. I wanna make a video on it. And they asked me whether I wanted the hardwired version or the pedestal version. Of course, I wanted the hardwired version. But I also explained that I had the auto former hardwire kit and I wanted to run that in place. And then they had a great suggestion which was to get the pedestal version. And the reason for that is the hardwire kit for the autoformer isn't like hardwiring just the EPO. The EPO and even going to the, you know, the Southwire surge guard, like I mentioned, has the uh, four connections in, four connections out. So you just wire that directly in. There isn't a version like that of the autoformer. The autoformer only comes in one flavor, which is designed to plug in on one end and then you know a male on one end, a female on the other end and just plug it in in line. 
And that hardwire kit is basically allows you to put that whole system inside your RV. There's a female plug receptacle that you would wire to your shore power, and then you would plug your autoformer into that. And then there is a male plug that you would run typically to your ATS or to a junction that goes to your distribution panel. But the great idea that Hughes had was, you know, since I'm going to be wiring that in anyway, just get the pedestal version and keep it inside. And this got me thinking, you know, there were a few times in our 397 where I would have liked to have easily bypassed the, uh, the power, the surge protection, uh, you know, just for various reasons, maybe to troubleshoot a power issue or uh, whatever. There were times when I wanted to be able to bypass that. And doing this method would let me do that really easy because I just have a plug in here. So as we go over this system, that's where that whole idea was born. Now, from this point forward, it's going to be a little bit different because we have this Volta system and our wiring is different than most RVs. In most RVs, you've got a plug on the side uh, that you for your shore power that goes into your basement. From there, if you've got a generator, that line typically goes to an ATS or automatic transfer switch. That transfer switch basically switches between that shore power and a generator. And then out from there goes to the distribution panel. But we have the Volta system, so what we have is our shore power connection goes straight to this front bay here. Uh, and then through the Volta system, which we'll get to. But everything I'm going to show you that I did in here could also be done in the basement up behind the wall up there. Now, you know, obviously every RV is laid out different. Where you would put these things is going to vary quite a bit. Um, up here, it was pretty easy because I have a nice big flat wall. So uh, just keep that in mind. You know, this setup that I'm going to walk through here could go in the basement. It could go up here, depending on what you have. Now this was my first time wiring anything electrical besides you know outlets that you might have seen in uh, previous videos. So step one was to investigate this Volta system and just see what's what. And I discovered it was actually pretty simple. Coming from our shore power goes straight to a junction box down here. That junction box then has an out cable. It was just 6.3 Romex like you'd find in any household uh, and like we've used in previous projects. Uh, 6.3 just means it's a six gauge, three wire, really four because of the, of the ground. That ran right to a junction box up here. And then from that junction box wired straight into the Volta system. Going out of the Volta system, there is another junction box and then that goes to the distribution panel. So it's a pretty straightforward path coming shore power inside the RV, into the Volta system, out of the Volta system. But those junction boxes made it pretty nice. So the first step was to disconnect, well, first of all, shut off power, always shut off power. But the first step in wiring this thing was to disconnect the input to the Volta system from that junction box. So now I've got my wires in there from shore power that I can wire to my new female 50 amp plug. I got some 6.3 Romex, like I mentioned from Lowe's, and I basically spliced that into that junction box and then up to the female plug. I decided uh, I, I wanted to use butt splice connectors in there, which are I feel are a little bit more resilient versus uh, you know wire nuts. Now you know a lot of people will poo-poo the whole idea of wire nuts anywhere ever, uh, but particularly in an RV where things are shaking around. So if wire nuts are going to be used, I would do it the way Volta did. Uh, a you have a large enough wire nut rated for the size of wires that you're going to put together. But also, you don't just put the wire nut on and be done with it. You want to wrap it in tape because you don't want vibration to, you know, shake that wire nut loose. I decided to go ahead and use butt splice connectors. These things are great because it's a nice, thick copper tube. You put the wires in both ends, you screw them down. Then you have a special heat shrink that is designed to be an insulator for that. But it has the added benefit of shrinking down on those little screw heads that you tighten down on the wires and stopping those from backing out. So it makes a really, really good connection. So I got that wired up and I mounted my female receptacle right up here. Got my outlet there, good voltage, runs down behind there and to that junction box right there. So now it'll be a little bit easier because I'm not going to be in that freaking corner. Bent my back over this thing. The next step was to connect the Volta system's input to that plug via a, a standard male plug. Now I toyed with the idea of wiring in just you know a Camco replacement male receptacle right to the 6.3 Romex going into the Volta system. 
But if you're familiar with 6.3 Romex, it's super, super stiff. And if I ever got into a situation where I wanted to be moving the plugs around or do something in there, I didn't want that super stiff wiring. Uh, luckily, the hard wire kit for the Autoformer came with a uh, about a meter long, uh, very flexible cable, just like you'll find going into your RV, you know, your, your regular power connection with the mail plug already on it. So I decided I was gonna wire up another junction box. I used the same kind that, that Volta did down here, the square metal box uh, from Lowe's, very simple. So I took the input to the Volta system, wired it to this junction box, well, I should say through the junction box to this other cable. So now that I've got my female receptacle up there connected directly to shore power, and I've got my male connector connected directly to the Volta system, just a matter of plugging it in. But of course, the whole idea here is to use the watchdog EPO, right? All I had to do was plug in the EPO, plug the Volta system right into that, and it is good to go. Got power applied, going through the junction box here. Cover off right now, I'm monitoring power We've got 27 amps going through line two and 35 through line one. 27 on each line approximately is for uh, charging. We're down to about 50% because I've been running off the inverter all day while I work on this wiring. So now you're probably wondering, why didn't you hardwire in or connect in the auto former with all this stuff like you know we originally talked about? I kind of decided that I wanted to just save the auto former from when we actually need it. And I like the flexibility I have down here because if I want to use the auto former, all I got to do is plug it in just like a, a pedestal down here. I plug the auto former in, then I plug the EPO into that. Uh, I could forego the surge protector and, and, and wire just the auto former if I wanted to. It just gives me a lot of flexibility down here. The other thing I wasn't too keen on was, you know, the auto former is really designed to go sit on the ground it's about that high and the way the plug is oriented on the auto former it basically if this is the auto former it plugs in this way versus this way again because it's designed to go on the ground so i wasn't real keen with how it was all going to kind of line up in there and just decided that i wasn't going to use the auto former all the time anyway i did however go ahead and take advantage of the mount i had already purchased and mounted it up here uh, just to kind of keep it on the wall and out of the way but it does still reach the plug and now if i need to use the auto former i just plug it in it's so simple one feature i really like about this watchdog epo is its bluetooth capabilities our surge guard didn't have any sort of bluetooth abilities it only had a hardwired uh, little monitor with a tiny display and it would show us the information as we toggled through it and it was okay but having this app is so much better i can see amps on line one and line two i can see the frequency i can see the voltage the wattage one thing i also really like is this total energy use you can reset it it's almost like a trip meter for your kilowatt hours and you might think well, why do you need that well one really good reason is when we mooch dock meaning we are at a friend's house and plugged into their power I like to know how much power we use so that we can give them money for that. The other reason might be if you're in like a monthly site that's metered, maybe you want to click this every month and then compare your kilowatt hours used to what the park says you used. Now with this setup, there are a couple more steps that I plan on doing before we hit the road with this thing. I wanted to find some way to kind of secure the watchdog EPO to the wall. And I started getting out wood and thought maybe I could, I could uh, two-sided tape it to the wood, then screw the wood to the, the wall. Thought maybe I could use the wood to the wall and then zip tie it or something along those lines. And then I thought, you know, maybe somebody's already thought of this. <laughs> so I went to the Hughes website and sure enough, they have a mounting bracket. So I've got that in order. And as soon as that comes in, I'll be able to mount this Watchdog EPO directly to that wall. The other thing that I will probably do is take some zip ties behind the receptacle just to make sure those things don't pop out. I think if I secure the watchdog itself, those aren't going anywhere, but I like to be better safe than sorry. If you got some value out of this video, please give us a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't already. If you have any questions at all about this install or any of this stuff in here, put them down below in the comments. I will try to get to those. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.